Hello and welcome to part 2 of the GWN7800 Switches video guide series. In this video we will cover the switch port settings, PoE settings and VLAN settings. The port info page and their overview displays the status of all interfaces on a GWN7800 series switch. By default, GWN switches will auto-negotiate the link speed. So when you connect a device to a port on the GWN switch, the device and the switch will negotiate the transmission speed of the port. The green color indicates a port speed of 1 gigabits per second. The orange color is displayed for ports using 100 megabits per second and less. And unused ports will have the light gray color. The PoE icon is also used to show the ports used by powered devices. Here, for instance, I have ports 10, 18, and 20 used by IP phones powered by PoE. If I need to have detailed information about specific port, I simply choose the port and click on it. So here under the basic info, it provides us with information regarding port 10. So the status is up and running. The negotiated speed is 1000 megabits per second or 1 gigabit per second. The duplex mode is full. Flow control is set to auto. We can also view some statistics regarding port 10, which basically gives us an idea about the amount of traffic that is both sent and received for different types of traffic, such as uh, unicast packets, multicast, and broadcast. To manually configure parameters such as speed and duplex, we go to switching, port basic settings, and here we have access to the ports configuration page. So for example, if we select port five, it will provide us with the option to include a description for that port. For example, if I have an IP PBX connected to this port, I can just label it with IP PBX. By default, all the ports are enabled. So if you have some ports on the switch that are not being used and you want to disable them so nobody will connect through these ports, you can change the status to disabled. The ports are configured to auto negotiate the speed. If you need to explicitly define the speed for the port, you select from 10, 100 and 1000 megabits per second. So if I want to set this port to fast ethernet, I can just select 100 megabits per second. The duplex mode is set to auto. If I want to force full duplex, I can just simply click on full duplex. Next, we have the flow control. And flow control is basically a layer two uh, mechanism that is used to synchronize the rate of data transfer between the switch port and the connected device. This feature is useful because it enables the receiving end to tell the sending end to pause sending data when there is a congestion at the receiving end. So if you decide to enable flow control, just make sure it is enabled on both sides. So let me just sit down back to enabled and save and apply the changes. GrandSwim offers the GWN7800 P series layer 2 switches that support dynamic PoE output. Power over Ethernet or PoE enables the switch to provide both data connection and electric power over the same Ethernet cable to power devices such as IP cameras, access points, and IP phone. GWN7800 series supports the standard 802.3AF and 802.3AT, or what is usually called PoE+. So the switch provides power output based on these standards. And within these same standards, we have classes that define the power output limitations. So while 802.3AF uses classes 1 through 3, 802.3AT uses class 4 type, which has a maximum power output of 30 watts. So let's switch to the web interface of the switch so we can look at the settings related to PoE. So under port info, if we go under PoE power supply, here it provides us with information regarding the PoE settings of the port. So if I select port 10, the information that provides me here is that PoE is enabled for this port and it is using class 4 and the maximum power output is 30 watts. So that tells me this device supports PoE+. Plus. This is the current power. This value will change. So every time you refresh the browser, you'll see a different value. And the power supply priority is set to low. So let's go to the PoE settings so we can understand what these settings are. If we click on global, here it provides us with some global settings, like this switch is using 24 ports for PoE. 
The total PoE power supported by this switch is 360 watts. The PoE remaining power is 20 watts. This is something that you can figure manually. And the PoE remaining power is basically the amount of power supply reserved for a situation where there is a sudden surge in a power consumption by powered devices. By default, it is set to 20 watts, but you can change it as I will show you in a moment. The configured value, this is the total amount of wattage that is already assigned to uh, devices. If we go under settings, this is where we configure the PoE remaining power, which is set to 20 by default. You can increase it or decrease it based on your needs. So if we go to the interface configuration page under PoE, this is where we have access to PoE settings regarding specific ports. So for example, if I choose port 5, here I can select which standard to use on this port. If I want this port to use 802.3 AF only, I can select this port. Or I can choose the 802.3 AT, which is backward compatible with 802.3 AF. The power mode provides us with three options. There is the shutdown mode that will disable PoE on the port. You select this mode when you want to make sure that power is never applied through a specific port. The auto mode, which is the default, makes the switch automatically detect if the connect device needs power. This mode also allows the switch to automatically assign power based on the standard and class. And we have the forced mode, which statically pre-allocates power to the port even when there is no power device connected. This mode basically ensures that the defined power will be available for the port. So when you select the force mode, you must also define the power limit. I would use the force mode for critical devices that rely on PoE. Just ensure that the custom limit that you configure under here match the maximum wattage needed by the power device. So for example, if I have an IP PBX that supports PoE Plus and we know that PoE Plus can go up to 30 watts of power supply, I can set that one to 30, then save and apply the change. If we choose the auto mode, the switch will determine the maximum power output for power device based on which class the device belongs to. That is something that the switch automatically detects. You can also manually set a power limit per port. So the defined maximum output will not be adjusted by the class provided by the power device. So because power is predefined with a custom limit, only a power device that uses less than or equal to the defined limit is guaranteed to be powered when it is connected, of course, to the uh, switch port. However, if the power device belongs to a class that requires more than the custom limit, the switch port will not provide power to it. So you need to be cautious when you set the power limit to user mode. Next, we have the power supply priority, which allows us to configure how the switch responds if a power shortage occurs. Basically, the priority determines the order in which PoE is turned off from ports if a power shortage occurs. Ports with low priority will be the first to have PoE turned off, then high priority. Critical has the highest priority. For instance, if you have an access point powered with PoE, you can set the priority to critical so that PoE does not turn off when there is a power shortage on the switch. Under the global settings, the configured power on the switch is 52. This is because we have three interfaces connected. So we have interface 10 using 30 plus 7 plus 15. So that gives 52 Watt that is already assigned to these ports. If I go to port 5 and I choose the force mode and I select, for example, 25, then save. What happens if I go to global settings is that the configured power now increased to 77. So even if I don't have any device connected to the gigabit port 5, the switch will allocate that 25 watt and it will not assign it to any other device. So before we get into VLANs, let's use this flat network that is not using VLANs. All devices connected to the switch can see and hear each other because they all belong to the same broadcast domain. So if one host sends a broadcast frame or packet, all devices in the same broadcast domain will receive that traffic. And that eventually generates unnecessary traffic in the network because some hosts might not need to receive that broadcast 
traffic. So this might not be a serious problem in a network with a single switch, but in a network with multiple interconnected switches and without VLANs, the broadcast domain will essentially include all the switches. And when a host sends a broadcast frame or packet, it will be sent to every port on every switch in the network. And that is not efficient and could impact the performance of the network because of the amount of broadcast traffic. That is where the first major function of a VLAN comes into play. VLAN or virtual local area network allows us to segment the physical network into virtual or logical networks. Basically, we can group hosts or devices into separate networks based on functionality or user type. For instance, we can group all the IP phones into a separate VLAN for VoIP devices. This way, the broadcast and multicast traffic will be confined within the broadcast domain of the VoIP network. And this improves the network performance by reducing the amount of the broadcast and multicast traffic in the physical network. So in addition to confining the broadcast domain and reducing the network traffic, VLANs provide flexibility in terms of applying security policies. So by putting hosts in separate VLANs based on functionality, we can go to the router and apply the inter-VLAN rules to tell the router which VLAN is allowed to talk to a specific VLAN. The reason we need to apply these rules at the router level because inter-VLAN is handled by the router. Ports with VLAN configuration are generally set up in one of two ways, tagged or untagged, sometimes called trunk or access respectively. Access ports that link endpoint devices are usually set up as untagged ports, and they only accept traffic for only single VLAN. So when you plan to connect a computer or an IP camera to a switch port, the access port will be set up as untagged because the traffic sent by the computer or an IP camera does not have a VLAN tag. On the other hand, tagged or trunk ports are usually set up for interfaces that link into a router or another switch. Tagged ports are usually configured to handle traffic for multiple VLANs and separate them based on the VLAN tag. So as shown in this slide, the ports connected to the router and the switch are set up as tagged because their purpose is to carry traffic for multiple VLANs. Also, when we configure port as tagged or trunk, we need to specify the VLANs that are allowed on that trunk and both sides of the link need to have identical configuration. In a situation where you have an IP phone manually configured with VLAN tagging, the ports to which it is connected should be set up as tagged because the phone will send tagged traffic to the switch. Besides tagged and untagged, GWN7800 switches support hybrid mode. And hybrid mode is usually applied to a port that provides connection to tagged voice VLAN and untagged data VLAN. So while tagged mode supports a single untagged VLAN and multiple tagged VLANs, hybrid mode supports multiple untagged and tagged VLANs. So next we're going to switch to the web interface of the switch so we can configure the ports based on the information provided here. You can access VLAN configuration settings and their switching VLAN. As you can see here, we only have the default VLAN, which is VLAN 1. So we need to create VLAN 20, 30, and 50. Let's start with VLAN 20. So when you add VLAN 20, we go to edit, and then we're going to select the ports 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we're going to click twice so that we can enable and tag, because these ports will be used as access ports, so we need to set them up as and tag. Since the router is connected to port 24, we want VLAN 20 to be tagged on that port. Save. So we're going to repeat the same process for VLAN 30 and 50. So now we have VLAN 20, 30 and 50 created. So the port that is connected to the router is going to have those VLANs tagged. Something that I need to keep in mind is that the subnets for VLAN 20, 30, and 50 must be configured on the router because inter-VLAN routing takes place at the router level. So now that we have the VLANs created, we tagged port 24, which is going to be the trunk port, and the other access points will be untagged. 
So we go to port settings. So we're going to select port one to four, then edit. We're going to change the link type from trunk to access. And as you can see, automatically it will switch to Antag mode. The port VLAN that we would like to use in these ports is VLAN 20. So we're going to repeat the same process for VLAN 30 and 50. So if we go to port members, that's going to show us the ports that are members of specific VLAN. So we have port 1 to 4 members of VLAN 20 and ports 5 to 8 are members of VLAN 30 and ports 9 to 12 are members of VLAN 50. And then we have port 24 which is going to be the trunk port that will be directly connected to the router. So we need to tag VLAN 20, 30 and 50. Our engineers at Grandstream Help Desk can assist with any issues that you might run into while using Grandstream solutions. You can submit a ticket by going to helpdesk.grandstream.com.